Hi everybody, welcome to Overby Fine Art. Today I wanted to show you my technique that I use for doing my oil paintings. And the first stage that I do is actually the underpainting, which is done completely in burnt umber. And what I do is I take burnt umber and I mix it with a little bit of medium. Myself, I use liquid original. And I mix that with the burnt umber and I put it on the entirety of the canvas. I take a paper towel and I wipe it evenly across the canvas so the paint's evenly distributed. And then as you see here, I find all my whites or my lights in the reference photo. And then I start pulling them out with a paper towel. As you see here, I have some underneath the chin area, on the chest area, and back of the tail, the ears. So I'm going to start pulling out those colors using a paper towel and I also use a Q-tip, which I'm doing right here. And then later on, you'll see me actually using a brush to pull out the brightest of those highlights. When you're doing something like this, you need to make sure that you pay close attention to your reference photo. Here, this Pomeranian, it looks like she has a lot of white, but if you look especially underneath the chin area, there's certain areas that are extremely brighter than the others, even though it's all white. When you actually look at the tonal value, then this is where you really find your brightest brights and your darkest darks. So right now I'm starting to pull out the hair on the ears. I'm getting the highlights around the tops of the ears. <clears throat> and the reason why you like to do something like an underpainting when you're doing an oil painting is, A, it adds a lot of depth to the painting that you're doing. And B, it also gives you a map to follow whenever you do start the next stage, which is the color blocking stage, which I'm going to do in a different video in the future. But right now, as you can see, I'm starting to get those highlights around the legs and the back of the head there. And I do like to do my highlights first, and then I go and I put in my darks. For me, it's just easier that way, but if you think that you may want to do, you know, just the opposite, you can try that, see what works best for you. I'm starting to get around the eyes, trying to bring that out a little bit. Now, here's where I was talking about that I start to use a brush. And what I do is I take a clean brush and I dip it in my medium, which I said that I used the liquid original, and just a tiny bit. And I slowly start to pull out those teeth. You can't do this with a Q-tip. You can't do this with a paper towel. It's just too big. I think that I was using either a zero or a number two flat for this. Um, and as you see, it just works perfectly for what I need it for because the Pomeranian teeth are just so small. So now I'm going to move on to the eyes. I went ahead and I, I don't add any more of the medium to my paint. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start blocking in the eyes. And since this Pomeranian's eyes are so dark, I went ahead and just blocked in the entire thing. And then I'm just going to pull out those highlights that I see. It's just easier that way instead of trying to work around the highlights. Now I have it blocked in. And I'm going to go in with a Q-tip and I'm going to start to pull out those highlights that you see in the reference photo there. Now I'm continuously wiping that clean brush and getting any of that excess paint off. Oh. 
and it can be kind of a slow and tedious process, but this is actually sped up. It takes quite a while to get all those colors out, but it is definitely worth it in the end. So now we're moving on to the actual fur of the dog. The main thing here is that you want to make sure that you are paying close attention to the tonal values of the dog, of how dark things are, how light things are. You're in between, between your lights and your darks. All that is so important. And something that I have found helpful over the years is I actually get on Pixlr which is a free app online. And I will put my reference photo on Pixlr. And when I do that, I put it on the SEPA. And that gives me an idea of what my painting should look like as an underpainting. It helps me to just see just those tonal values. So now I've moved on to the nose. And as you can see, there's really not too much. There's a little bit of texture in there, but for the most part, this dog's nose is pretty smooth. So it's just a matter of getting your blending right. I'm going back in and darkening up the pupils of the dog with a black. And then I also use black for the nostrils. This will be the only time in this painting that I actually use black. I don't like to use black. When you use black, when it dries, it has a matte look to it, and it just it's not very vibrant. So very rarely will you ever hear anybody using a black. But I do use it in the pupils and in the nostrils. So let's go ahead and move on to the mouth now. This dog actually has quite a bit of dark on the right side of its face. So I'm making sure that I get that dark enough and then I will slowly blend out to get a little bit lighter. And there's a, a really pronounced highlight there on the lip. So make sure that when you're painting that you pay close attention to that stuff. It'll give that wet appearance to the dog's mouth that you wanna be able to make sure that you capture in your photo especially if you're going for realism, which is what I like to paint. So as you see, I made sure to leave that highlight. I slowly blended out the lip area so you can distinguish of where the jaws actually come down from the mouth and where the, the lips of the dog actually are. The next area here that I'm working on is the teeth. Now you gotta think about how your, the teeth of a dog is actually going into the gum. So where the teeth meets the gum, you will have the, the shadows of the tooth that are actually going there into the gum. So make sure that you pay close attention to that. The rest of the gum will probably be a lot lighter but right there where the teeth and the gum meet, you need to make sure that you get those darks in there. Make sure that you pay close attention to the shape of the teeth also, because a lot of times dog's teeth, they're not straight. And most of the times they're actually pretty crooked. So pay attention to your reference photo with that also. Now we're moving on to the inside of the mouth where the tongue is. And for right now, I'm just trying to make sure that I get the dark there underneath the tongue. And here's another good example about paying attention to your tonal values. When you're looking at the dog, where the, the mouth, the top of the mouth is casting a very dark shadow on the top part of the tongue going back in the inside of the mouth. So I want to make sure that I get that a lot darker and then work my way out to get those highlights on the tongue. All right, now we are moving on to the fur. I'm working on the back part of the dog here, um, which is quite a bit darker than the rest of the body. 
the way that the dog is sitting. And make sure that whenever you're looking at the dog, that you do pay attention to how the dog is laying. In this photo, you see that the her name is Coco. She's laying in the floor and her body is going back, but it is slightly twisted just a little bit. And it's giving you this dark line going from her back all the way down to where her leg is. And then also you have there at the top of her leg, you have a very dark shadow too that you need to make sure that when you're putting it in there that you that you capture that. And if you do it now in this stage of the underpainting, you will it'll be so much easier when you're blocking in because you already know where your darks are and your lights are. I'm moving on to the tail now. Now the tail is pretty light. It's not as it's not as light as the front of the face. But she does have a lot lighter fur here. So I'm not going to, and it is pretty um, fluffy. So I don't really have to do too much, but I want to capture those main lines that you can see from those darks and those lights there. Now moving on down to the leg. And trying to make sure that I get the blend and the look of the fur and the way that it's laying there on the back of the leg. Whenever you're doing your brush strokes, make sure that you always brush in the direction that the hair is growing. It's very important that you do this. If not, then it's just not going to look correct. I noticed that the back there wasn't dark enough, so I went back over it again. With a little bit more paint. And like I said, I only use burnt umber in this stage of the painting besides the black that I put in the pupil and in the nostrils. Now, as you see here, I'm using a flicking motion. And because when you look at the reference photo, you see that the fur where she's laying down on the floor, it actually comes out. So when I do that, I press and I flick the brush it gives that appearance of her actually laying there on the floor. I'm going to move my way up now and start working on the top of the head. Where the top of the head and the ears meet, I have, there's a pretty dark shadow there. I want to make sure that I capture that. And as you see, I'm brushing and I'm brushing in the direction that the hair is growing. And you can already see that it's starting to develop that texture without actually having to put in every single hair. But it gives the illusion that it's actually there. Now at this stage right now, it kind of looks a little funny. You know, I've blocked out some of my whites. I'm starting to put in some of those darks. After I get those darks in on the chest, I'm going to go back again and pull out those highlights that are going over the dark. For me, this is just the easiest way about going about this process. It's constantly going back and forth between your lights and your darks, but I do find doing the light, putting in your darks, any other lights that may be overlapping those darks, I like to put those in, and then I just keep working from that in that pattern. Just keep putting in those darks around the eyes. I haven't really pulled out the lights enough yet for the for the for the mouth of the dog, the nose of the dog, but I will do that and it will break up the the lines of the dog. I can't think right now. Now I'm gonna go over really fast with just a mop and gently mop over the entire dog and this will just smooth out the fur, give it a more natural blended appearance. You always want to use a mop in my opinion when you're doing pets. And it, it gives a more natural look to the fur when you do this. As you can see, it's starting to smooth it out, give it that fluffy look that you want to have with pet fur.
All right, now that I got everything blended out, we're going to move on. And what I'm doing now is I'm going to try to get even darker on those areas on the back part of the dog that just they're not dark enough. And it and if you get to where your medium is starting to dry, which happens with this liquid original after a couple of hours, then stop if it starts to get tacky and you notice that your color is pulling up off the canvas and you're not wanting to pull up, then just stop. Let it dry. It's usually dry within 24 hours, especially when you paint this way and it's it's a thin layer. It will dry. You can go back in the next day and you can get those darks that you want. You won't be able to get the lights anymore, so make sure that you try to get all those lights on that first day, but you will be able to add those darks. So don't, don't panic if you don't get those darks in the first day. It's okay to separate these out over a two or three day period if you need to. So now I'm going in and I'm putting in another dark layer underneath before I pull out those final highlights. You have to be able to have the contrast between the darks and the lights for them to show up really well. And for this dog, you can see in the reference photo that there, there's a, a huge contrast there on her, underneath her chin where those lights and those darks meet. And I wanna make sure that I really capture that. And to do that, I have to have it dark enough underneath. So now I'm going up to the top of the head to make sure that I have those dark enough. Don't feel like they were quite dark enough, so I'm adding in just a little bit more. Now I'm going around the eyes, making sure that everything is dark enough. She has that little spot there in the center of her head, around her, around her nose and her eyes. Just make sure that everything is as close to the reference photo as I can possibly get it. Because like I said, this is going to be your map. This is going to be your guide for whenever you start adding those color layers. And it's very important. This is actually, in my opinion, the most important stage of the painting process. Pulling out some of those highlights. I felt like I got that a little bit too dark and I, I lost the shape there of that the lightness there around the eye. So I had to pull out a little bit of that, going back and evening that out a little bit more. Now let's move on down to the leg. As you see the way that the dog is laying, the brush marks need to kind of go up and then over to give that appearance of how the hair is laying on the the, the hair is laying with the dog there. And for this painting, I use mainly flats and mops. I don't think that I really use any other brushes. So for this painting, all you would actually need is those, those flats and mops. I think that I mainly used a, a 0, 2, 4, and 6. For my mop was a 3 4 inch and maybe an inch for this. I didn't use, I, didn't, I always try to keep my, my brushes down to a minimum because then I start getting confused on what sizes that I use for what. And you don't really need all these different brushes. I really, I have about 10 brushes that I use on a constant basis. And besides that, I use the other ones occasionally. But I always have some good flats and some rounds and some mops. Mops are a must, especially when you're doing pet painting. I'm going back now and I'm seeing that the, the tip there on the tail is just not bright enough. So I'm getting a Q-tip and I'm pulling out some of those hairs that got lost when I did mop it with the brush. Like I said, you're just constantly having to go back and forth, adding color and pulling out color. She 
She has a really strong highlight there on the right side of her head that I'm getting now that, you know, it again got lost. And I want to make sure that I have that pulled out to where you can see it. Another thing that you can do is if you find that you're not getting the color out like you want to, you can actually take that Q-tip just like you do with the brush. You can dip it into the medium and dab off the excess liquid or whatever medium is that you're using and use that to pull out the hairs too or the fur or whatever it is that you're using it for. And that's another way you use it just like you with the brush. It'll get out those highlights and sometimes just the, the Q-tip won't work. As you see here, it was coming out a little bit, but not as much as what I wanted it to. So I used some liquid, I'm sure, and then now I'm starting to get those highlights out that I see there on the dog's nose. Now, just to talk a little bit about myself, as you can sit here and watch me pull out some of these highlights, I am a self-taught artist. I've learned everything from all these amazing YouTube people, all these other YouTube artists that are just so kind to share everything that they have learned. Um, and I've been painting now for about two years. Um, I find that this classical underpainting and this classical painting, I'm sorry, is the best technique for me. I like the fact of having this this natural tone on my canvas instead of using white. I like the fact of having the underpainting and only starting out with one color. It makes it easier to, un, you're not having to overthink and think about color mixing and everything. You're just using one color. And honestly, sometimes these underpaintings are so beautiful by themselves that you could just have an underpainting and just have it in this one color and it's beautiful alone by itself. So I think it's a good technique to learn. It teaches you about tonal value, which is so important when it comes to painting. But I do want to say that I just finished up this pet course and I do want to give credit where credit is due. Um, and it was an amazing teacher. Her name is Marion Dutton. She has a YouTube channel. Her um, It's called Ma's Art Studio. She's based out of the UK, I believe. And I just finished up her pet portrait course. And I learned so much from doing her course. And if you, if you can, I would definitely highly recommend taking her course. She offers everything on her website. Um, and that's where I took the course from, but she has lots of YouTube videos too. So I just want to, you know, give credit to her because she is an amazing teacher and I learned so much from doing her pet portrait course. She offers other courses as well. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, to give credit where credit is due. I've also learned from, you know, lots and lots of YouTubers over the years. I've started out with graphite and watercolor and charcoal. And I, the only thing that I can honestly say that I haven't done is acrylic. I've never tried my hand at acrylic. I started using colored pencils and fell in love with colored pencils. And then I started using oils a couple of years ago and I just absolutely fell in love. So if you, if you use different mediums, I guess my point is if you try all these different mediums, don't give up until you find the one that you love to use, that works for you. Don't try to force yourself to use these, these mediums that just aren't working for you. But back to the painting, I'm giving this another mop just to, to check out everything, see if I'm liking how everything is looking. I've lost a little bit after I mopped at those highlights, so I want to pull those back out again. And as you can see, as I'm pointing here, I want to make sure that I have that blend between those darks and those lights, and I think that I've accomplished that pretty well. So I'm going to go on and I'm going to move on to the ears. 
I'm going to get those dark so they're not, they're not nearly dark enough right now. And when you want to get that, that defining line between your highlight and your low light, I find that if you put the line across and then you slowly blend it out, it has more of a natural look. So that's something also to consider whenever you are doing your underpainting. So now I want to pull out those hairs that are going over the ear. As I said before, I like to put those darks in and then pull out the lights. That is the easiest way to do it. I'm just working my way around the ear, making sure that I have all those hairs coming out in the correct direction. And I've noticed that I've kind of lost some of those darks. So I'm going to use my brush with a, a chiseled edge and I will slowly go back and forth working in some of those finer lines just to kind of break up those, those um, lights there. And then I slowly brush upward to give those little small hairs there on the top of the ear. Looking everything over now and I see that at the top, I need to go and start adding in some of those more detailed hairs that you can really see there in the front of the face. In the back of the body, they're not as pronounced, but there in the front where your focal point's going to be around the eyes and the, the center of the face of the dog, you really want to take time with your highlights and your low lights and maybe getting in more of those finer details, even at this stage. Pulling out any highlights that I see there on the legs and the chest. making sure that everything is blended out smoothly. And I like to use this Q-tip to get those thicker clumps of hair. It, it gives a very nice appearance to those thicker clumps of hair. Now I'm taking that mop again. I'm getting more now toward the end. I want to make sure that everything is blended out smoothly. If there's anything that I notice, step back, look at your painting from a distance, you know, five, six, seven feet. See if there's anything that stands out to you. When I started doing this, I noticed that around the eyes, I needed to make them a little bit darker so they look like they're set back in the head. So I started adding a little bit dark there around the eyes. And it'll really give that natural look that you want with when you're painting realistic. Notice this right here wasn't quite dark enough, so I wanted to darken that up just a little bit. It really is just a constant of adding darks, taking away a little bit, adding a little bit more darks. Never go full force with super dark because it's a lot harder to get out. You know, gradually build up your colors. I noticed that there on the side of the dog, it wasn't quite dark enough. So I'm going to darken that up just a little bit more too. Trying to work on the shape of the nose there. And 
And now I'm using my smaller brush. I believe that is a flat and it is a zero, maybe a two, just to get those final details.